Good morning, class. Today we're going to be talking about documentation and specifically documenting a C sharp program using XML style comments. So, this is something you've probably done before, but you may have not realized why we do it and uh, what real benefits it has. So, we're going to delve into that today. And we're going to continue from the project that we've been working with, this vector library project. And we're basically going to add some documentation. Now, before we jump into it, I want to show you a couple things in Visual Studio. So, for example, if I hover over console.writeline, you've probably noticed this uh, as you've been working in this library or with C Sharp in general, it tells us some information about how to use that method. And you might be wondering, where does this information actually come from? On the other hand, if we hover over one of the methods we've written, like this subtract, notice it just tells us that what the uh, expected structure of that method is and no other information other than this plus one overload. Um, so what, what does this actually mean? What, where, where does that information come from? Well, that actually comes from our documentation, our inline documentation that we write with the class. So let's jump to this Vector3 class. And let's start with a, the class itself. So when you do three slash marks above a class, above a property, above a method, uh, you're actually saying, I'm going to start an XML style comment. So this is treated by the compiler as just a regular comment for the most part. It doesn't really do anything with it. Uh, but it has special significance for Visual Studio, and it also gets compiled into the code. So I, I said it didn't really affect the compiler, but it kind of does because it uh, actually gets incorporated into DLLs especially. Uh, so that information sticks around. It, it gets converted to another format, but that's unimportant. Now notice the looks of this. We have summary. And that's a tag that looks very much like the HTML tags that you guys work with in your intro course. Uh, and it works very much the same way because HTML and XML are actually related. HTML was derived from XML. So this should start off being fairly comfortable to you. And the summary tag you would expect summarizes what this class is for. A class representing a three element vector. We'll say, and providing instance and class methods for working with them. And just to reiterate, a class method is a method that's defined at the class level. It's one that we've defined with a static keyword. Uh, so it is invoked by using the class name dot in the name of the method. And it exists basically across the class itself. An instance method is also defined in the class, but it operates on a specific object created from the class. So we go back to that idea when we construct an object. Uh, we look at the class, use that as a, uh, a template or a blueprint for how that class gets laid out in memory, and uh, also what instance methods can be used with that. So an instance method is just a regular method. A class method is a static method. They're just different names for the same idea. Now if we go back to our program and our console program and we hover over one of these definitions of uh, vector 3, notice that now it tells us that that is a class representing a three element vector and providing instance and class methods for working with them. It pulls our summary and displays it whenever we hover over that component. So that is a really important and useful feature of Visual Studio and one of the big reasons that we want to go ahead and add this into our class libraries. Now remember, Vector3 is defined in this assembly, but we're actually working with this program. And if we actually pull that assembly into another program that wasn't even defined as a project here, which we can do and we will be doing later in the semester, you build a DLL file, a dynamic link library file, and that can be used in the place of having direct access to this vector library project to use that vector library with any other program you write in the future. When you do that, it's going to receive all of the same information from those comments. So those comments are actually a really powerful way of conveying the information that you want to have uh, shared. Now, along with that, uh, we can go ahead and look at our first property, the X property. Again, if we do the three slashes, 
Visual Studio will auto-generate the summary tag. We can also do that ourselves manually. We don't have to uh, rely on Visual Studio. So if you're editing this in VS Code or you're editing this in uh, Notepad++ uh, or Nano or Vim, uh, you can go ahead and add your summary just the same as you would here, only you have to type the summary tag yourself, the, the actual tags uh, and the three slashes. So what we want to do here is summarize what this property represents, the x component of the vector. And it doesn't matter if we're using what kind of syntax we use to define that property. So the same uh, thing holds when it's an auto property. The same thing holds when we're using uh, lambda expressions. We just want to give a summary, the y component. And if we jump back to our program, we can see these in play. So here, for example, when we do 1.x, we get the x component of the vector. 1.y, we get the y component of the vector. And we haven't written a comment for z, so notice that it just tells us that this is, has a get and a set and it's a property. It really gives us no more information than that. So again, adding these summary comments helps convey a lot of information to the user. Okay. Let's uh, tackle a method. So let's jump down to the add, uh, and we're going to comment this one. So again, three comments, three slashes, and we get the summary tag. And then notice we also get this param tag. So when we do a method, if it has a parameter or multiple parameters, we need to add a param tag for each one of those. And notice that each param tag has a name attribute, which should correspond to the name of the parameter. Uh, so that's asking us what that actually is for. In this case, the vector to add to this one. And what our summary is, is we're going to say adds vector. And we could just type other, but there's actually a special param ref tag that gives us some extra functionality where it actually creates a reference back to this parameter. So there's a, a linkage between the two. Uh, that's used in the doc when we create the documentation. It can create things like hyperlink to jump between the two, which may seem overkill when we only have one parameter, but if you have a method that takes in 10 or 12 parameters, which you may end up writing down the road, uh, having that linkage can help quickly jump to the information that the programmer that's working with your code really cares about. Uh, so adds a vector other to this vector. And if we go back to our program, if we hover over the vector or one subtract, notice that there is no um, information there. If we were to do 1.add, on the other hand, notice it gives us all our information that we're adding another vector to this vector. So we just basically subtracted two and added two, so we should be back at the same magnitude at that point. Uh, but you can see the difference in the documentation between these two methods. And that's really the purpose of doing that. And notice too that the vector other is hyperlinked here. Uh, so it really doesn't make a huge difference here. But the other use for this is we can take these comments and we can generate documentation automatically as an HTML or actually a collection of HTML files. And that's what Microsoft does, for example, to generate its documentation on uh, the MD MSDN website. So where you go to find out more information about C Sharp as a language, most of those web pages were actually generated directly from the source code using these techniques. So it's a very powerful way of going about uh, documenting your programs. And it means that you don't have to write a ton of extra documentation as a completely separate document. You think back to the uh, epic source code that we looked at. That source code was written, and then they had a completely separate document that was authored completely separately as its own text file that documented the program, described how it was used, and they had to keep those two in sync. And if you read through a lot of old programs, you'll find the documentation often really lagged behind what was actually in the code. Uh, by putting the documentation directly in the code, we help solve that major problem. Uh, let's do uh, another method. In this case, let's jump down to one of our static methods. 
Notice that uh, here we're returning a vector 3. So let's do our add method that returns a vector 3. And you'll notice we have one extra tag now. We have a returns tag that's telling us, oh, we're also returning a value. So as long if our method is void, which was the case with this add because we're mutating the current object, uh, then there's no need for returns uh, tag. But if we are returning a value, we need a returns tag which describes what we're actually returning. So in this case, we are uh, returns a new vector containing the sum of vector A and vector B. So I grabbed the wrong one there, so I'll do it in this order. So I like A to come before B, although it really doesn't matter with addition, but it does matter with subtraction. So then uh, the vec one of the vectors to add And then our return value is the sum, uh, let's say vector sum, of A and A and B. So sometimes I get students asking me, what should I actually put in here? What words do I need to use? You just need to describe what this does in plain English in a way that another programmer can read and understand. So think about what would convey the right meaning to you of what that object or that class or that method is doing and add a description that really uh, gives you that, that information. Now, let's go back to our program and let's look at uh, one of the other examples. So for example, the console.writeline method here. Uh, notice that it has an exception list, an IO exception. So it's telling you this code may throw an I.O. exception. That if you use this method, there are some circumstances where that exception would be thrown. And I know we have, you haven't probably talked about exceptions too deeply in your prior classes. We're going to talk about them a bit more down the road in this class. Uh, but if you are using exceptions, we're supposed to document those as well and provide some more information. So let's jump back to our X parameter here, for example, uh, one of the things we talked about is when we use this private back and field syntax, we can do some checking, for example, to make sure that uh, uh, this X value is not a double dot NAN, which means not a number. So if it is the case that what you're trying to set, not, not X, value, if the value coming in is not a number, then we don't want to set this, maybe. Uh, if we do that and we throw a new, in this case, argument exception and describe what the problem is, must be a number. Now we've changed it so that this throws an exception. We'd want to add an exception tag here. Uh, and it takes one argument, which is a C ref. This is a reference to what specific exception it's throwing. In this case, system dot argument exception. And most of the ones that are defined in the C sharp language are going to be in the system. So system dot argument, system dot null exception, null pointers, and all those exist there. We can also write our own exceptions. If you do that down the road, then it would be in the namespace you defined it in. And then we need to describe when it would throw this. And so in this case, thrown when the uh, value is set to not a number. And if we go back and look at our program, and we go to somewhere where we're using that X property, notice that it now lists the exception, argument exception. And we can even code follow the definition if you want to to see what the argument exception looks like. This is just where it's being declared in the system library. This is one of the cool features of Visual Studio. We can take a look at existing classes. We can open them up and see what their structure is if you need to know that. So for the most part, uh, the argument exception extends the system exception. And we'll talk about uh, what that really means in a future class. And then we have a bunch of different constructors. And uh, then we have uh, a property to get the message and a property to get the uh, 
pram name, so the pram that was involved. Um, and notice that we can add uh, to the uh, a parameter name referring to what parameter of the method was the problem. Now in this case, because it's a property, it's only the value param. We don't really need to have that level of detail. But if we were throwing this on a method, we might add that because that gives the uh, person who's writing the code, seeing the exception, more information to work with to fix the issue that they are running into. Okay, so that kind of wraps up our, our quick discussion of documentation. You are going to be using this style of documentation throughout the semester. So every time you write a public class, property, or method, you need to do, uh, document it. Now, do we need to do uh, private backing fields? It's not as important for auto documentation, but it is helpful, especially if there's not a clear connection between what that is. Uh, so in this case, we can just say private backing field for the X property. And that just, again, gives us some reference to go back to. Now if we hover over our X here, it points to where, where that is declared. This is especially helpful if you have your private backing fields declared in one spot and the properties that work with them in another spot. I like to actually pair them, so I usually do my private backing field right above uh, the property it's working with. I've known programmers who actually like to put all of their private prop, uh, backing fields right at the top of the class and do the properties later on. And especially if you're doing that, that would be important. For this class, go ahead and document every property, every field, every method, and every class. And also, if you do an enumeration, document the enumeration. If you're using structs, which we probably won't be, but if you do, they're documented exactly the same way. So all of these same ideas occur. If you're throwing an exception, you should have an exception tag the, describing why and when you would throw that exception. If you're doing a documenting a method, you should have a param uh, for each parameter that's being passed into the method. And of course, if it's empty like this normalized, there would be no params. And then if you have a return type which is not void, you need to also uh, document what you're returning. So all of these need to be populated. Now before we close, I'll show you one more tool that we have created for you to help you with this process. So if you go to your tools, uh, you will find, or sorry, is it tools? Yep, NuGet Package Manager. So go ahead and go to that Tools menu, go to the NuGet uh, Package Manager, and see this Manage NuGet Packages for Solution. Uh, this is not the only way you can do it. You can do it from the command line, but students tend to prefer this, and I find it fairly easy. You go to Browse and search for ksu.cs, and it'll take a moment to find this Code Analyzers package. We have written that contains code analyzers which look at your code and find some common mistakes, including uh, if you have not done your documentation. And you can add that a, to every project or just a single project in your class. Click this install. And it takes just a minute to download. Well, it'll ask us permission to download it. And do we accept the license? And once we've done that, it will download it. And we can go back to our code. And now, anywhere that we have not documented correctly, we will now have a warning. If we go look at this, these specific warnings refer to when uh, what we haven't documented. So in this case, we haven't done the link uh, with a summary tag. We haven't done a pram tag for parameter A, and we don't have a returns tag. So this can help you figure out where you've missed things and go back and do them. Uh, so this was something we authored as a tool for you to use. Uh, you can also... Notice these are hyperlinks. If you click on those, those are going to take you to our website where it will describe what the issue is and how it should be documented. So in this case, we're missing an XML summary tag. Every method should be commented using XML style comment with a summary tag, which should uh, look like something like this example. So we give you a code example as well. Uh, that's something that we've added to our Visual Studio uh, approach of teaching. In this class, we're working it back into 300 and some earlier classes, uh, but it's a nice thing. It also looks for some very common mistakes that programmers, uh, starting programmers make and helps describe what those are. So some of them are actually going to be highlighted as errors and what will allow you to compile. 
but they're there for a very specific reason, it's showing you that you're doing something that is going to cause problems down the road uh, that you may not be aware of, and it really helps give you some un deeper understanding of what that problem is and why it is a problem, and therefore what you need to do to fix it. So I highly encourage you to uh, use this uh, throughout the semester. For your milestone project, we've actually included that in the uh, project already, but as you add new projects, you'll want to re-add it for those projects. And that wraps us up for our discussion. For the rest of the exercise, just make sure that you add comments to everything, this XML style comments, just like we talked about. For anything you haven't commented yet, go ahead and create, uh, push your changes, create a new release, and turn that in. And that's what we'll have you do for that particular exercise.